Welcome back. On today's memorable neurology, we're going to go over the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia are a collection of nuclei that live in the subcortex and are highly involved in regulating voluntary motor movements. As this picture suggests, the basal ganglia are incredibly complex. However, let's try to break them down to be as simple as possible. The primary role of the basal ganglia is to take an initial signal from the motor cortex in the frontal lobe and then modify it as it passes through them on its way down to the muscles in various parts of the body. Different parts of the basal ganglia act to either amplify or diminish this initial signal. This has the effect of refining the movement by amplifying signals to the muscles it thinks will get the job done best and inhibiting signals to muscle groups that are not needed. Compared to the impulses generated in the motor cortex, we are not necessarily conscious of the changes in movement produced by the basal ganglia. For example, when we decide to pet a dog, we are likely conscious of the initial decision to begin that action, as it is first generated in the motor cortex. However, we are then unaware of all the small, minute adjustments that the basal ganglia make to ensure that the action is smooth and that we are not petting the dog too soft or too hard. The basal ganglia consist of several structures that all sit deep in the brain, as seen in this image. The specific parts of the basal ganglia include the striatum, which is made up of two parts, the caudate and the putamen, which we'll talk about later, the globus pallidus, the subthalamic nucleus, and the substantia nigra. These are the same structures we saw earlier. This picture is better at showing that these structures do not operate independently, but rather work as part of two interconnected pathways. This picture is complicated, so let's ditch it and instead use a simplified schematic to understand this. These two pathways, known as the direct pathway and the indirect pathway, each act to modify signals from the motor cortex. These pathways both end up at the thalamus before looping back to modify motor signals coming from the cortex. Recall from the last video that the thalamus is involved in processing sensory information. From this, we can learn that the specific effects that the basal ganglia have on the motor signal is heavily reliant upon sensory information. Let's go back to the example from earlier about petting a dog. If we are petting the dog too hard, we can pick up on that that the dog doesn't like this via sensory information traveling through the thalamus from our eyes and other parts of our body. By getting input from the thalamus, our basal ganglia can modify the strength of our movement to be softer and more in line with what we were trying to do in the first place, pet the dog and make it happy. The specific way that the basal ganglia modifies movement depends largely on whether it goes through the direct pathway or the indirect pathway. The direct pathway is the more straightforward of the two and generally has an amplifying or excitatory effect on the initial motor signal. For example, if we are not petting the dog hard enough and need to pet it harder. The direct pathway travels from the cortex to the striatum, into the internal globus pallidus, and finally to the thalamus which sends the signal back to the cortex for further refining. You can remember this sequence by thinking that the direct pathway comes straight into the thalamus. In contrast, the indirect pathway takes a longer route through the basal ganglia and generally exerts a diminishing or inhibitory effect on the initial motor signal. For example, if we're petting the dog too hard and should back off a little. The indirect pathway starts out similarly to the direct pathway and that the signal is generated in the cortex and travels to the striatum. However, it then exits the direct pathway into the external globus pallidus before traveling to the subthalamic nucleus, the internal globus pallidus, and finally the thalamus. You can remember this route by thinking that the indirect pathway comes straight, exits, then sidesteps into the thalamus. To understand what is happening in each of these structures, let's look at the neurotransmitter involved in each. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter, while GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. The logic here follows the rules of math when multiplying positives and negatives, so let's see what effect each pathway has. The striatum and the internal globus pallidus both have an inhibitory effect, but these inhibitory effects cancel each other out like multiplying two negatives, giving the direct pathway an overall excitatory effect. In contrast, the three inhibitory neurotransmitters and one excitatory neurotransmitter in the indirect pathway follow the rules of math to produce a negative, giving the indirect pathway an overall inhibitory effect. 
So we now have a general sense of what all the individual structures in the basal ganglia are doing in terms of whether they are inhibitory or excitatory. However, there's more nuance to them than that, so we'll now look at each component one by one in more detail. In both the direct and indirect pathways, the initial signal from the motor cortex first travels to the striatum, which is itself composed of two things, the caudate nucleus and the putamen. The caudate nucleus is highly involved in any form of goal-directed activity and plays an important role in other cognitive functions such as memory and sleep. For this reason, you can think of the caudate as the most cognitive part of the basal ganglia. In contrast, the putamen is more exclusively dedicated to motor functions and appears to play a role in both preparing and executing voluntary movements. This is illustrated clinically in patients who develop bleeding in the area of the putamen, known as a putaminal hemorrhage, who will often present with weakness or even complete paralysis of muscles throughout their body. So whenever you see the word putamen on an exam, look for the answer involving motor functions and put an M for motor. The subthalamic nucleus, or STN, is found only in the indirect pathway. While the subthalamic nucleus releases an excitatory neurotransmitter, it acts on the inhibitory internal globus pallidus to ultimately produce inhibition of movement. The subthalamic nucleus's inhibitory effects are illustrated in a movement disorder known as hemibolismus, which involves dramatic flailing movements of the limbs, almost like someone is involuntarily swinging a golf club or throwing a football. This occurs after the subthalamic nucleus becomes damaged, as the inhibitory effect of the indirect pathway has been removed, resulting in excessive movements. While rare, hemibolismus often shows up on tests, so it's helpful to think of someone swinging their arm while throwing a football during Sunday night football to remember hemibolismus in the subthalamic nucleus. The final part of the basal ganglia, known as the substantia nigra, which is Latin for black substance, is located not in the subcortex, but in the midbrain down in the brainstem. You may have noticed the structure in the diagram of the direct and indirect pathways earlier, even though we hadn't talked about it yet. The substantia nigra is not immediately involved in either the direct or indirect pathway, but it still plays a role in modifying movement by acting on the striatum directly. The substantia nigra uses the neurotransmitter dopamine to influence the basal ganglia. Dopamine is best thought of as being like grease, or WD-40. It does not cause movements, but rather facilitates them. Just like you would use WD-40 to turn a rusted over hinge into a smooth gliding one, dopamine makes someone's movements fast, fluid, and smooth. On the flip side, someone with reduced production of dopamine in the substantia nigra, such as a person who has Parkinson's disease, will be much less likely to initiate movements, leading to muscle stiffness, rigidity, and slowness. In summary, if you remember nothing else about the structures of the basal ganglia, remember that they are generally involved in refining motor signals. As such, abnormalities involving the basal ganglia often produce movement disorders. You wouldn't expect to find full-on weakness or paralysis of muscles resulting from a lesion in the basal ganglia for the most part, because they are not involved in producing motor signals directly. Instead, dysfunction of the basal ganglia leads to uneven, uncoordinated and or rough movements that are either excessive or insufficient, depending on which part has been damaged. Alright, that's it for the basal ganglia. In the next video, we'll visit the internal capsule, so stay tuned.